Hello everyone, I'm going to attempt to be doing a video of residue theorem here. Now I'm not going to get into a lot of details, but we are going to talk about what residues are and of course what the residue theorem is and entails with a few examples. So first off, exactly what is a residue? Well, we say that if f of z has a simple pole at z equals a, that just means that z equals a basically will, will result in a zero denominator of the function, then we define the residue evaluated as z equals a of f of z, spelled out like this, res um, of z equals a of, um, or as equals a, or as equals a of f of z is equal to the limit as z approaches a of z minus a times f of z. So essentially, you can imagine that f of z has some type of denominator that's basically of the form z minus a, or it has z minus a as a factor in the denominator, which makes sense because when z is equal to a, you then have a zero denominator. So that's kind of what we're trying to say here for the simple pole scenario. So multiplying that by z minus a will cancel that factor in the denominator, and then this limit will actually exist then. So that's kind of the idea. That's why it's called residue, is because it's what the denominator leaves behind if you attempt to plug in zero in the denominator, ignoring any factor that would make the, the denominator zero. So that's kind of the idea. Now, of course, we're going to generalize this. If f of z has a pole at z equals a of order k, so not a simple pole, but it has, so imagine like, um, you have a factor of z minus a to the third power or something like that in the denominator. That would be this scenario. Then we have this crazy formula here, which I'll say the residue um, for z equals a of f of z is the limit as z approaches a of 1 over k minus 1 factorial times the k minus 1 derivative of z minus a to the k times f of z. So the idea here is you multiply by however many z minus a's you need to cancel them out completely in the denominator, then you take the k minus 1 derivative of that, divide by the k minus 1 factorial, and then take the limit as k approaches 0. Now, why do we need all of this other stuff? Why do we need derivatives and factorials? It kind of has to do with Cauchy's integral formula. And I'll remind you what that is in the next screen. Um, but you'll kind of see that this has um, kind of an association with that formula, with the generalization of that formula when um, f of z has a pole of uh, order k. Now, in general, though, if f of z has this so-called... Lorentz series expansion, which if you're familiarized with Taylor series, that's basically what Lorentz series is only, instead of going from n equals zero to infinity, it goes from n equals negative infinity to infinity. So now we have these so-called negative coefficients as well as positive ones. So we have a minus two or a, a sub negative two coefficient times uh, z minus a to the negative two plus a sub negative one times z minus a to the negative one plus a sub zero and so on. So this is a so-called Lorentz series centered at z minus a. Again, we're not going to get into too many of the details here, but long story short, the residue of z of f of z at z equals a is the negative first derivative, as it turns out. So we're basically going to sometimes use this. We won't really use this too much, um, but I'll, I'll be using at least one. I'll be doing at least one example where we'll be seeing this used. Um, I think, but right now I think we have enough information to maybe do an example or two of residues, finding residues, and then we'll see the residue theorem. Okay, so for these uh, few next examples here, we want to find the residues, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to simplify things by factoring out z minus the singularity. So here, if you set the denominator equal to zero, it's pretty simple to see that if you just add two divided by three, z is equal to two-thirds. So z minus two-thirds is a factor of the denominator, and you can kind of see, if you just pull out the number in front, that will actually always happen. So we're going to replace our denominator with this, and the residue at this singularity, two-thirds, residue at z equals two-thirds of our function, f of z, just ends up being plugging in two-thirds to everything, ignoring this factor in the denominator that would make it zero, when you plug in z equals two-thirds. So if we ignore that, we end up getting z squared over 3. So we're going to take the limit as z equals 2 thirds, or z approaches 2 thirds, I should say, of z squared over 3, which ends up being 2 thirds all squared is 4 ninths over 3 is 4 over 27 in the end. So that is our residue. Fantastic. And for the next one, we're going to look at this z squared plus 1, and it actually factors like z plus 1 or z plus i times z minus i. And you can also see that because if you um, if you actually set z squared plus 1 equal to 0, you end up getting that z is equal to positive or negative i. 
So z minus each of those will end up being z plus i, which is z minus negative i, and z minus i. Also, since it's squared, they're each squared, and you're probably waiting for me to write that. Okay. So we're going to replace that denominator with this factor. Now, for the residues, there are two singularities here. So let's deal with the first one first, when z is equal to i. Now, because the order here is 2 and not 1 like we had for the first example, we're going to have to take the first derivative of whatever we get ignoring um, each of them one at a time. So for z equals i, we're going to ignore the z minus i. So we end up getting cosine of pi z over z plus pi or z plus i squared. And we have to take the first derivative of this and then divide by um, uh, 1 factorial. And the reason why we're doing 1 is because if you remember from the formula, it was the order of the pole, which in this case is 2, but then minus 1. So that means 2 minus 1 is 1, so we have to take the first derivative and then divide by 1 factorial. So a derivative of this using the quotient rule will give us all over z plus i to the fourth. Derivative of the top, which is negative pi sine of pi z, times z plus i to the second, that's regular of the bottom, minus regular of the top, that's cosine of pi z, times derivative of the bottom, derivative of z plus i all squared by chain rule is 2 times z plus i to the 1, times derivative of the inside, but derivative of z plus i is 1 plus 0. So the two I just, I'm pulling in front here. And now that we have the first derivative, now we're going to let um, z go to i for this one. Now, okay, so when you plug in uh, z equals i here, you end up getting, let's just follow me, um, so this is of f of z, you end up getting negative pi sine of pi i times i plus i squared, that's 2i squared, 2i squared is 4i squared, i squared is negative 1, so it's times negative 4, um, I guess it's okay. Minus 2 cosine of pi z, but again, um, z is i, so it's 2 cosine of pi i. And then i plus i, again, z is equal to i, that's 2i. But notice 2 times i, that's going to be 4i. 2 times 2i is 4i. All over i plus i to the fourth, which is 2i to the fourth. 2i to the fourth is 2 to the fourth times i to the fourth. 2 to the 4th is 16. i to the 4th is actually positive 1. So we end up getting this. We can divide top and bottom by 4. Notice here we have a double negative actually, so it's positive really. But divided by 4, we'll cancel that 4 there and cancel this one, just leaving us with i cosine of pi i. And again, we're dividing by 4 on the bottom as well, so we get that. Okay. Now just to recall some evaluations, for sine and cosine, if you don't remember, sine of z is e to the i z minus e to the negative i z all over 2i, where cosine of z, very similarly, is e to the i z plus e to the negative i z, but now all over 2. And I'll allow you to verify it on your own why that's the case, but it's essentially because each e to the i z and e to the negative i z, well, they end up being... Um, conjugates actually, but they're, um, they're basically of the form cosine of z plus i times sine of z, for the positive one anyways. For the negative power one, you end up getting the conjugate of that with the negative in the middle, so that's why kind of this pans out the way it should. But now when z is equal to i, sine of pi i ends up being e to the pi i minus e to the negative pi i. e to the pi i, if you don't remember, is negative one. So for sine of pi, um, sine of pi i, you end up getting negative 1 minus this reciprocal of negative 1. That's negative 1 plus 1. So that's 0 over 2i, which is still 0. And cosine of pi i will end up being, you end up getting, let's see, that's negative. Um, right. It's going to be, again, e to the pi i is negative 1. So it's negative 1 plus negative 1. That's negative 2 over 2. That's negative 1. So that's kind of interesting that i kind of acts as an integer multiple of pi because sine of any integer multiple of pi is zero and cosine of any um, odd integer of pi is uh, negative one. So it's kind of similar looking to what we're used to.
So what that ends up giving us here is 0 minus negative 1 times i. So actually 0 plus i. So really this is just i over 4 in the end. Perfect. And now next for the residue for or at z equals a negative i of f of z. And what's interesting about this is that here we're going to ignore the z plus i factor in our denominator because that would be 0 when z is equal to negative i. And when you ignore this one, you get cosine of z over z minus i squared. And that derivative will be the exact same thing as this, only all of these plus i's turn into minus i's. And then when you were to plug in a negative i into that, you'll end up getting... Let's see, it's negative pi sine of sine of pi times negative i. So it's sine of negative pi i. And I'll let you to verify that sine of negative pi i is also 0, and cosine of negative pi i is also negative 1. It's not too hard to verify that because sine and cosine, of course, are odd and even functions, respectively. So this will still be 0. This will still be um, negative 1 for the cosine part. That's going to be negative i minus i, that's negative 2i, times negative 2, that's positive 4i now. Um, well, it's positive 4i, but the cosine makes it negative, because cosine would uh, result in negative 1. So that'll be positive 4i, or I guess negative 4i, because of like the triple negative here, over, and again, this is going to be negative 2i all to the fourth. That's still going to be positive 16, because you have a negative number to an even power, so it's still positive. So this will actually still give the same thing, only now it's negative. So it's going to be negative i over 4. So I'll allow you to kind of verify some of those details on your own, but it's not too difficult to see. It's very similar to what we just had here. Great. So now finally, we have the residue theorem. And the residue theorem basically is derived from Cauchy integral formula. And I'll write down the basic version of Cauchy integral formula for us. And that was 2 pi i, 1 over 2 pi i, times the integral along some region C, closed region C, of f of z dz. Well, not f of z dz, but it was f over, if you don't remember. It was f of z over z minus a dz is equal to f of a. That's what the simple version of Cauchy integral formula said, where a is some simple pole of z, that is contained in the region C. So this is kind of like a generalized version of this a little bit. Notice if you multiply 2 pi i to this side, you basically get f evaluated at a times 2 pi i. Now f evaluated at a, since f is the numerator, this function f ends up basically being a residue, at least f of a ends up being a residue of the entire function on the inside. Because to find the residue as e equals a of this entire function on the inside, what do you do? You ignore the denominator, z minus a, which just leaves us with the numerator, which we're calling f of z in this case, and then evaluate it at z equals a. So that's literally f of a. So f of a literally is the residue of the inside for this simple pole, and then multiplying both sides by 2 pi it gives us this. Only here we actually have a sum of residues. So this is true for all residues of our function, as long as those singularities are contained in this closed region c that we're integrating along. So it's a little complicated, but really it's just connected to the uh, Cauchy integral formula. And if we know how to find residues, I don't know how that escaped me, but I was going to say residues, not resides. But if we know how to find residues, like we did for these examples, then we can actually calculate integrals just by taking 2 pi i times the sum of the residues over all singularities that are inside our, our region that we're integrating along. Great. So now we're going to see an example of this, or maybe two examples. Um, actually, I'll do one example now. I'll do one example using this, and then after that, after that, we'll do another example. But the next example will involve a substitution that's not super obvious. So first off, I want to show something that will be kind of more obvious, but it'll involve a kind of tougher residue that we haven't seen up to this point. So let's take a look at that example right now. <clears throat> All right, so here we have kind of a strange one. We have the integral along this circle of radius 1, centered at the origin of the complex plane. So if you don't remember, again, uh, absolute value z equals 1 is just a set of all points on the complex plane, or complex numbers on the complex plane you could think of. 
that have a distance from the origin of one. Because that's what absolute value means, just distance from the origin. So literally, it's just all points on this unit circle in the complex plane. That's kind of the way to think of that. Um, now also notice that if you plug z equals zero into one or, uh, e to the one over z, you end up getting undefined. So there is a singularity here. This is known as an essential singularity. It's not a simple pole. This is an essential singularity. And the reason why is because, um, I mean, you can just kind of see just looking at it, this is not a fraction where the denominator is z. I mean, kind of is because one over z is in the, in the uh, exponent, but it's a little different. So for that reason, our formula for residue doesn't actually quite work. We need instead something a little more heavy duty. We need to use the Laurent series expansion, which I want to show you, of course. Now, it requires us to know a little bit of Taylor series. So let's kind of recall the Taylor series expansion of e to the z. is e to the z is equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity of z to the n over n factorial. And that's just, well, z to the zero over zero factorial, which is one, plus z to the one over one factorial, which is just z, plus z to the second over two factorial, and so on like that. So you get the idea there. And the third one, if you're curious, is z cubed over three factorial, which is z cubed over six. So maybe I'll just include that one closure. There we go. But now what does this mean for e to the 1 over z? Well, if you replace z with 1 over z, you end up getting the e to the 1 over z is this sum. And that kind of simplifies a little bit, um, but we'd have to maybe write it out. So we end up getting, I mean, again, when n is equal to zero, you end up getting zero, um, one over z to the zero, so it's still this, but then plus one over z, plus one over z to the second over two, plus one over z to the third over six, and so on, like that. So again, this simplifies a little bit, Kind of like that. And actually, if you were to write this in a kind of different way, one can say that this really, if you kind of write this expanded out this way, is one sixth z to the negative three plus one half z to the negative two plus one times z to the negative one plus one, and that's it. Because the other, if you keep going for positive powers of z, the coefficients will just be zero. And that's because there are no positive powers of z in this expansion at all. And the residue then would be what? So let me just write here above that the residue for z equals zero of one over e to the z ends up being the negative first coefficient of our Lorentz series expansion. Namely, it's just one. Now you have to be kind of careful because technically you have to center your series at, um, at our residue, or not residue, but at our singularity. So if we center a series at z equals zero, that just means we're looking at powers of not just z, but z minus zero, which is still z, z minus zero z. But that's an important detail because if this singularity for some reason was z equals one, then this wouldn't work. We would need a center of z equals one. So these powers, instead of being z, would have to be z minus one. That's a little harder to do in general, but you kind of see the idea a little bit. In fact, it would just literally be replacing this with z minus one and you get something kind of similar. So, and then in fact, let me just say kind of in general that you use these kinds of ideas to get something like that. So this is good motivation to start off. So this actually residue ends up just being one as it turns out. So it's not super striking or anything, but it still is a little, I don't want to say difficult to show, but it is something that you definitely need to show still. Good. And that's kind of it, right? Because since we know our only residue for our only singularity at z equals zero, that is contained in this region, this guy ends up being two pi i times his residue. So our answer is two pi i times one 
So an answer is literally just 2 pi i. And there we go. That's it. That's the answer to this, to this integral. So now we're going to move on to another example. This will be the last example in this video. But it'll be an example that doesn't look like a complex integral at first. But it actually is. And we're going to use um, something to get it to that point. And then finally, we're going to use residue theorem to solve the problem. So let's take a look at that right now. Okay, so this example actually isn't super difficult, but there is a version of this that I think is a little harder, where the numerator is a cosine of three theta. I think I'll do a separate video for that one, actually, because it's a little more involved. Um, but here we're gonna do, what we're going to do, and it's actually a, a pretty standard technique, is we're going to turn this into a complex integral in order to use the residue theorem. So how do we do that? Well, the first kind of key hint is that the integral goes from 0 to, to 2 pi. So if we consider something like the unit circle, the unit circle, every point on the unit circle can be thought of as z equals, well, e to the pi theta, where theta goes in between 0 and 2 pi. So in fact, one can say that every point on this circle is either the either the i pi or i theta, I should say. I say it goes from 0 to 2 pi, which we kind of just said. But moreover, we can say that if uh, we have an integral of z, a complex integral along the complex variable z on this region, then we can use this parameterization to change the limit of integration to 0 to 2 pi. And we can use that idea in reverse to convert this into a contour integral along this region. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to use this exact equation here as a parameterization. So if z is equal to e to the i theta, how can we write each of these in terms of z now? That's kind of the idea here. And it's not very difficult because notice, um, let me just do it over here, I guess. If z is equal to e to the i theta, its derivative dz is i times e to the i theta d theta. But notice since e to the i theta itself is z, we end up getting that dz is equal to i z d theta. So that dz over i z is equal to d theta. So anywhere I see a d theta, I can replace it with dz over i z. Now what about cosine of theta? That's actually not too bad. We saw that earlier. We saw the cosine of z was e to the i z plus e to the negative i z all over 2. So cosine of theta very similarly would be this. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to now change this integral because for this new parameterization, if theta goes in between 0 and pi, then that means we're just integrating along this curve here. Our numerator can be replaced with dz over, I'll, I'll just do it like this. I'll pull the d theta off to the side and replace it with dz over iz like that. Maybe that helps. And now our inside becomes 5 minus 3 times this theme, which is all over 2 e to the i theta minus, actually it's plus, e to the negative i theta. There we go. That looks good. Now, obviously, there's a, there's a lot we can do here to simplify things a bit. Let me kind of erase some things here. Uh, let's multiply top and bottom by 2i. I think that's okay. Um, right, 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 right. Because notice, since e to the i theta is equal to z, that means this ends up being z plus... 1 over z, or z to the negative 1, if you like, over 2. So if you multiply top and bottom by 2, I said 2i to get rid of that i, but the i in the denominator ends up not being too big of a deal. Let's multiply top and bottom by 2, and, and even further, let's pull that out. So I'm going to pull out 2 over i out of this integral, because it's a constant. Now if we were to multiply the top and bottom by 2, that makes this 10 in distribution. That will cancel this 2 in this denominator and just leave us with 3 times the quantity z plus z to the negative 1. Now we still have a z multiplied to this 2, so I'll pull that, put that in front actually. 
And then we have DZ with nothing on top. Perfect. So, so far, not too bad, actually. Okay. Now, if we distribute the Z and rearrange things a little bit, we end up getting, um, I guess it's going to be negative 3Z squared. So that's negative 3Z, negative 3Z to the negative 1. But when you distribute that Z, you get negative 3Z squared. And that would just be negative 3, which is negative 3. And here it'll, we'll have a 10z. So it's going to be 10z and then minus 3 with that. All right, so it's a little wacky, but that's what we end up getting. And actually, I think we can even pull out a negative. Maybe that's better. Uh, also, can we factor this? I believe this factors. I think this is how it factors. You can kind of tell because 10 is 3 times 3 plus 1, so that actually ends up working. It's hard to see at a glance, but with a little bit of experimentation, you can kind of see that. So I'm going to fact, fast track us to, um, through that factorization, but we end up getting this. Perfect. We're almost home free. Now we have to look at the denominators and see where our singularities are. Now our first singularity here that would be z is equal to one third. And our second singularity here is z is equal to three. And notice in our region of integration, we have a circle of radius one. Three is outside of that. So we don't need to worry about this one at all. But this guy is inside. One third here. It's a simple pole too, so that's good. Great, so now what? Now what do we do? Now what we have to do is find the residue. So we're gonna get that this thing, negative uh, two over i, is equal to two pi i times our one and only residue. Because normally it'd be the sum of the residues, but we only have one residue here. Uh, we would have had two if this was inside the, the region, but it's not, unfortunately. Or I guess it's fortunate because there's less work to do. So that's interesting. But what is a residue? A residue, again, will be ignoring this factor. So z minus one third. So to do that, let's do this. Let's factor out a three. So I'm going to replace this with three times z minus one third. There we go. So to find a residue, we ignore that factor. And then we plug in one third to everything else because it's a simple pole. So plug in one third into this. We get one third minus three. Um, well, one third minus one is negative two thirds. So this is two more than that. So it's negative two and two thirds, which I think is negative six thirds. Uh, I'm sorry, negative seven thirds. Maybe I'll just write it out. <laughs> so we have one over three, that's this guy. We're ignoring that one. And this is gonna be one third minus three. Now, one thing we can do to simplify this, and again, I think this is gonna be negative seven thirds. So I really think this is negative one over seven, but one way we can um, kind of take care of it is just multiply top and bottom by three. Actually, we don't even need to do that because this three is already here. So if we just distribute this actually, you end up getting one over one minus um, nine. Ah, so it was negative eight thirds, not seven thirds, okay. Well, this kind of goes to show what happens when you try to do things on the fly like this. Okay, great. So good, so we're in good shape, so that's it. So now, simplify it a little bit, it's not too hard to see. We get a double negative, that's positive. The i's cancel, two times two is four. Four over eight reduces to one over two. So in total, our answer is just pi over two then. Not a very obvious evaluation at all, but that's a really nice problem. That's all I wanted to say for this video. Thank you all for watching. Like I said, I think I'll do another video of a slightly harder version of this where we have sine of three theta in the numerator instead of just uh, one like we had here. But it's a very similar idea. We'll actually see more being used there because we'll have more residues and more, um, more. we'll actually have order of those poles, of those singularities. So that'll be interesting. But, um, but that's it for this video and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. See you then.